Most artifact discoveries improve or confirm our understanding of history, but some of them change it. They don't seem to fit with the existing narrative or belong to a time when they ought not to have existed. They're troubling discoveries for historians, but they're always fascinating to hear about. Let's share some of their stories together. The discovery of a set of ancient ceramic artifacts in Vietnam in December 2020 has shown new light on the relationship between Vietnam and China more than 1,000 years ago. This is a huge collection of Chinese porcelain, with items made during the Tang, Song, Yuan, Ming, and Qing dynasty eras. It was found at the site of the imperial citadel of Tang Long. The Song dynasty relics, in particular, are especially rare and prove that Chinese porcelain was in use within the ancient Tang Long Palace long before the 11th century. They represent a greater level of cultural exchange than was previously understood, best evidenced by the discovery of Lai Dynasty ceramics from the same era found at the same location. The Vietnamese Lai Dynasty ceramics are similar to their Chinese equivalents in both design and technological accomplishment. It now seems likely that it was the influence of Chinese ceramics that helped Lai Dynasty pottery evolve from the brown glaze line to the floral pottery that became an emblem of the era. You have to know your pottery to understand how significant this is, but it's blown the minds of those who do. The Aztecs and the Maya were among the mightiest of the ancient Central and South American civilizations, but they weren't the only civilizations worthy of note. There were also the Purapex, of whom we understand very little. That's why this artifact discovery from 2014 is so important. Archaeologists from Colorado State University, USA, were picking through the site of Anguamoco when they found a large burial site and a copper and bronze rattle. Anguamoco was once a pre-Hispanic city found in the modern Mexican state of Maicoacan. The Purapacas, who the Spanish referred to as the Tarascans, lived in Micoacan from the 11th century to the 16th. They spoke a language that doesn't resemble any other in the Americas and is of unknown origin. Tales of their bravery in battle were rife even at the time, and even the Spanish were wary of them because they successfully fought off the Aztecs for centuries. Despite their wariness, the Spanish eventually conquered them in the early 16th century, leaving very little behind for archaeologists to find. This discovery might only be one single rattle, a rattle that amazingly still produces sound, but it's still a glimpse at a culture we don't understand. Beowulf is an old English epic poem, written somewhere between the years 700 and 1000. It's generally seen as more of a fanciful text than an accurate historical record, but aspects of the text may have been proven to be true by a discovery from 2014. That was the year that 4,000 pieces of literature, known collectively as the Staffordshire Horde, were examined by an international team of experts at Birmingham Museum and Gallery in the UK. The Saxon Horde contains numerous examples of swords decorated with gold, which might be what Beowulf's unknown author was referring to when they wrote of warriors adorned with gold. There are fragments of jewel-encrusted helmets within the Horde too, which also seems to fit with Beowulf's narrative. It was once thought that only kings or local rulers wore gold-encrusted armor and weaponry into battle, but based on these findings, it seems possible that the whole warrior class dressed in gold. It might not have been the most practical or efficient material to use for such a purpose, but it would have made for an impressive sight as the gold-clad army marched toward your position. In March of the year 241 BCE, the Battle of the Agadian Islands took place between the fleets of the Roman Republic and Carthage off the western coast of Sicily. It was one of the most crucial confrontations of the First Punic War. In 2017, a team of divers found relics and artifacts that allow us to get closer to that ancient battle than ever before. At depths of over 300 feet, the diving team found a pair of bronze rostrums and a set of 10 bronze helmets. The headgear is of the Montefortino type, which was used by the Roman militias of the time. Most Montefortino type helmets are plain, 
but one of those recovered from the water features a relief of a lion's skin wrapped around the central cone close to the peak. That might indicate that it belonged to a commanding officer. Emperor Augustus created a military body called the Praetorians around 200 years after this, and the Praetorians wrapped real lion skin around their helmets. But the use of real skin might be based on the design we see here. The Romans were the eventual winners of the battle, which is said to have involved 200,000 participants. In 2018, Professor Eckert Fromm of Yale University was called upon to perform an unusual task. He was asked to verify the authenticity of a collection of 4,000-year-old clay tablets that were at the center of a U.S. federal case against the Hobby Lobby Arts and Crafts chain, which was accused of knowingly purchasing stolen goods. Eckhart could barely believe what he was looking at. The tablets, covered in cuneiform inscriptions, come from an ancient Sumerian city called Irasagrig. Almost nothing of the city is known, other than references to it from elsewhere. Professional archaeologists don't even know where it is. But it seems that looters and criminals do, because they found the tablets. They're part of a collection of over 5,000 artifacts from the lost city that were shipped illegally into the USA from the United Arab Emirates and Israel, beginning in 2010. Hobby Lobby paid $1.6 million to acquire them and was later fined $3 million for doing so. They also had to hand the artifacts back to the Iraqi government. Even the government doesn't know the location of Irisagrig, so it seems we'll have to rely on criminals if we're ever to find it. January 2016 began with an archaeological expedition in Honduras for experts from Colorado State University, and what they found there is astonishing. They'd only spent three days at the suspected site of the near-mythical white city in the Honduran jungle when they made their discovery. There, they uncovered more than a dozen artifacts, including stone jars with animal heads and geometric patterns on their surfaces, and a ceremonial throne. These finds, when viewed in the context of the earthworks, plazas, and earthen pyramid found in the area recently, confirm the existence of a previously unknown civilization in the region. There have always been legends of an ancient people living in the jungle in a so-called White City, also known as the City of the Monkey God. But it's only in recent years we've finally found traces of them. Nobody knows who these people were, what they were called, or even when they lived. Estimates range from a few centuries ago to several thousand years. These artifact discoveries represent only the beginning of the process of finding out who they were and telling their tale. The Vikings are often portrayed as little more than violent barbarians, but that description tends to come from the lands and peoples that they conquered. While the Vikings were undoubtedly skilled and brutal warriors, they were also accomplished seafarers, diplomats, and traders. This walrus tusk trinket might be one of the very first things they ever traded. Ivory was highly prized in medieval Europe, and it seems the Vikings found their own source of it so they too could capitalize on the trend. The tusk we see here is one of many that was sourced from Greenland roughly 1,100 years ago. It was a Viking colony back then, and the local source of ivory might be the reason that the Vikings colonized it and built villages. It's been theorized in the past that the Vikings colonized Greenland either because they needed new land to farm or they'd been exiled from other parts of Europe. The idea that they simply wanted to corner the market in Europe's most precious trading material is a new one, but is perhaps more plausible than the ideas that came before it. The Vikings had brains to go with their brawn. Nanotechnology is incredibly complicated. So when do you think human beings started experimenting with nanostructures? 10 years ago, maybe? 20? Nah. Try 2,600 years ago. In November 2020, scientists identified the oldest known human-made nanostructures inside ancient artifacts found in Tamil Nadu, India. It seems they were used in a layer of black coating applied to ancient pottery. The coatings are made of tiny carbon nanotubes. In fact, the nanotubes are the whole reason the layer has survived for so long. Prior to this discovery, 
Historians believed that the first intentional human use of nanostructures didn't happen until the 8th century. The secret of the nanostructures rests with the creation of the pottery, which must have been processed at temperatures as high as 1,400 degrees Celsius. How these ancient people created temperatures that high is unknown, but the technique is so sophisticated that we didn't even invent instruments capable of detecting it until the 1990s. If this strange black layer truly was created deliberately, the person who made it was more than 2,000 years ahead of their time. Perhaps it's more likely that they knew this type of coating would last, but didn't really understand why. The question of when complex culture first emerged in Papua New Guinea has long been an unresolved one, but it might not be unresolved anymore. That's all down to the discovery of a set of ancient artifacts in March 2020. It's always been known that the earliest settlers on the island planted bananas and yams. But opinions about when this led to the kind of cultural innovation seen in Europe and Asia used to differ wildly. However, these artifacts prove that the ancient residents of Papua New Guinea began making tools and producing works of art and craft at around the same time as their Eurasian peers, approximately 5,000 years ago. The objects were found halfway up the side of a mountain in Jiwaka province. The tools prove that the people of the time were capable of more than the wetland agriculture that was once thought to represent the peak of their capabilities until around 3,000 years ago. Here we see a carved stone face, an axe, two stone pestles, and a tool for lighting fires. Some of the tools appear to have been abandoned in a state of semi-completion, proving that they were made here rather than imported from more developed cultures. The people of Papua New Guinea weren't educated by their neighbors. They developed at the same rate and at the same time. While we're talking about ancient preconceptions, let's discuss the biggest one of them all, the idea that all human life came out of Africa. It's accepted as a fact by millions of people all over the world, and it's probably true. But it might not have happened the way we're so often told it happened. The most common theory is that the first human settlers left Africa by traveling around the coasts, but they might have actually gone straight through the Arabian Peninsula. That challenging theory is supported by the discovery of stone artifacts in the middle of the Arabian desert. The first of the artifacts were found in 2011, but more have been found every year since. In each case, the triangular objects have been found to be 100,000 years old. If they came from African settlers, it means that not only did they travel across the peninsula, but they also set off between 20 and 30,000 years before we thought they did. This creates a new mystery though. Definitely have been easier to travel along the coast because of the plentiful supply of seafood. So why did they march straight across an enormous desert instead? Let's give the established out of Africa origin theory another kick. In June 2017, archaeologists identified the oldest known remains of Homo sapiens in Morocco in the form of a nearly complete adult human mandible. The location of the find implies that rather than starting in one specific place in Africa, the species began to appear in multiple locations on the African continent at the same time. There is no single cradle of humanity in East Africa. Rather, Africa itself is the cradle of humanity. Before the discovery of this mandible, the oldest known confirmed Homo sapien remains were 195,000 years old. This jawbone is closer to 300,000 years old. The shape of the bone indicates that early Homo sapiens had recognizable human faces even that long ago, although their brains wouldn't have been anywhere near as developed as ours. The discovery was made at Jebel Irud, where archaeologists have also found flint blades. Some of them appear to have been burned. If our ancestors were fashioning weapons and setting fires 300,000 years ago, we might as well toss everything we think we know about human history out of the window. Could an Egyptian emblem belonging to a Roman emperor that somehow found its way to India prove the existence of a city once thought to be mythical? It seems too ludicrous to be true, but it just might be. 
This fantastic Sphinx seal was found during an archaeological survey at Padanam, Kerala, India in September 2020. The Sphinx seal is positioned atop a Greco-Roman style head of the kind seen on statues. It's thought to be a product of either the 1st or 2nd centuries. It's made of banded agate, so the combination of this and the Sphinx seal has led experts to believe that it belonged to Octavianus, the man who would eventually go on to become Augustus Caesar. So the big question is, what was Augustus Caesar doing here? Legend has it that during ancient times, a port called Missouris was the central hub of trade routes that connected the Roman Mediterranean, Greece, North Africa, Persia, India, and the Middle East. It's referenced in Tamil poetry, but its location has never been found. In the same layer of soil that the seal was found in, archaeologists also found pottery from every region we just mentioned. Could Patanam have been Missouris all those years ago? Is that why the emperor was here? We can't prove it yet, but it's a tantalizing idea. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications, and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching and see you soon.